Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Andrew Martin, Chancellor of Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, and thank you uh, for joining us for this vir virtual webinar, where we'll discuss the recent Cortex case study published by Drexel University's NOAC Finance Lab. Thank you to the folks at Drexel, Drexel for your leadership on this study. The report was both fascinating and inspiring to read. We are very proud of the success of Cortex and hope this case study can be a useful model for other cities as they think about advancing inclusive economic growth. I look forward to our conversation today as we look more closely at the findings and hear from several national and global experts. I also wanna say a word of thanks to our partners, in addition to Drexel University, who helped make this event possible, including Accelerator for America, MasterCard, the Global Institute on Innovation Districts, and the Washington University Social Policy Institute. Two decades ago, when the university first had a vision for the Cortex Innovation Community, we knew there was no way we could achieve that vision alone, nor did we think that was even a good idea. Indeed, the very concept of innovation requires heterogeneous ideas, concepts, and voices coming to the table to achieve what was previously unachievable. Therefore, innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens through collaboration, shared vision, and through a lens of inclusion. To that end, here at Washington University, we believe that the success of the Cortex Innovation Community and the success of our local economy and community more broadly is possible because of cross-sector collaboration between organizations like those present today. That's why we see each of your organizations as integral to helping us advance our mission to improve lives and specifically with a renewed commitment to be in, with, and for St. Louis. Cortex is just one of the many ways we foster economic growth in the region, and we look forward to even more collaboration to come. Speaking of vital partners in the region, I want to introduce our moderator for today, Marla Blow. Marla currently serves as Senior Vice President of Social Impact North America at MasterCard and the North America Lead for the Corporation Center for Inclusive Growth. In this critical role, Marla helps build strategies, partnerships, and programs that advance the center's priorities to promote financial security, make economic development more inclusive, support the economic mobility of workers, and leverage the power of data for good. Marla has a long track record of leadership and expertise in entrepreneurship and financial inclusion work with previous roles as founder and CEO of FS Card Incorporated and having served as part of the implementation team that stood up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I'm particularly excited that Marla is here to moderate this webinar today because of WashU's strong and valuable partnership with MasterCard. Among many cross-sector initiatives between our two organizations, I'm particularly proud that we've worked closely on inclusive economic development, thanks to strong leadership and collaboration from our Washington University Social Policy Institute. Thank you, Marla, for your passion for your work, your leadership, and your vision. And thanks again to all of you for being with us. I'll now hand it over to Marla to continue our program. Thank you so much, Chancellor. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the kind words and I share your appreciation of our partnership between MasterCard and WashU. It's been a phenomenal relationship for us. Uh, thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to a fantastic conversation today. I'm inclined to go ahead and jump right in and let me introduce Bruce Katz. Bruce is the director of the Novak Metro Finance Lab at Drexel University, and he is a previously was the inaugural Centennial Scholar at the Brookings Institution and Chief of Staff at the Department of Housing and Urban Development under Henry Cisneros. Bruce, we want to share some opening remarks with us and set the stage for the conversation that we are about to enter into. Uh, absolutely, Marla, and uh, thanks to all the co-sponsors of this. So we're going to put up a deck um, that I'll go through um, uh, over the next 10 minutes or so. And let me just put this into a little context. Uh, as Chancellor Martin says, uh, this is a city case. Um, at Drexel, we've been looking at institutional models that have been advancing inclusive growth, whether that's around innovation or redevelopment or around small business growth or workforce development over the past 15 or 20 years. And, and Cortex is a global model that, over, as Julie Wagner will talk about later, uh, is being looked at to be adapted 
uh, to other cities around the world. So next slide. Uh, Cortex is a, is a global model of an innovation district. So what Julie and I wrote about um, maybe seven years or so ago was a trend around the world where we saw the spatial geogra geography of innovation shifting from suburban or exurban research parks or isolated corporate campuses to dense geographic areas, relatively small, within central cities that connected uh, and mashed up advanced research institutions, mature companies, startup and scale-ups, uh, incubators and accelerators, all within an urban space that combines what cities do, uh, mixed use, transit accessibility, et cetera. So this is really a best case of an innovation district, which is an emerging trend. Next slide. What's interesting about innovation districts is they combine several different kinds of assets. Um, if you can move to the next slide, it would be great. Um, these are economic assets. Now, some of those are the anchor institutions and the research arms, but also mature companies that are in different kinds of sectors of the economy uh, that depend on high levels of R&D, and high levels of STEM or STEAM workers, many of which workers can, can get the credentials they need from two-year community colleges. So economic assets first, then physical assets. That's about this co-location and mixed use and transit accessibility. Um, so physicality of, of the districts matter because they're trying to promote a certain kind, as Chancellor Martin said, collaboration around innovation. And finally, networking assets. This is not just about buildings. Uh, this is about what happens within buildings and the constant programming. So an individual working in one element of innovation can connect to a different discipline or to marketing advice or legal advice. And again, this constant focus on business growth, formation, job creation, workforce development really critical. Next slide. Um, what makes Cortex so interesting is this element of collaboration and patient capital at its core, at, at its origin. What you saw are a number of anchor institutions, Wash U, St. Louis University, SLU, uh, University of Missouri, St. Louis, UMSL, Barnes Jewish Healthcare, Missouri Botanical Garden come together and essentially collaborate to compete. And they, they put on the table a level of patient capital, $29 million, uh, to make acquisitions of land um, without any real sense of immediate return so they can provide that platform, that foundation for longer-term regeneration. And then they found a partner, um, as Otis will talk about, in the city of St. Louis, that gave them eminent domain power, land use powers, and ultimately a tax increment financing district. So th this is how innovation occurs, but this is also about how innovation districts come to pass in many parts of the United States and around the world. It's this collaboration and patient capital, which is so fundamental. A uh, next slide. So here is Cortex. As you can see, it's 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 almost has like a Switzerland um, sort of notion. It's in between St. Louis University, uh, BJC Healthcare, uh, Forest Park, um, Wash U is is not on this map, but close nearby. UMSL is not on this map, but but close nearby. And as as we'll talk about as we move forward, uh, Wash U has put really remarkable assets, including a new neuroscience facility in the heart of Cortex. There also now is a Metrolink stop. Um, so there's transit accessibility, but this is a 200 acre, very compact, relatively small geographic node of innovation, of commerce, uh, and increasingly a platform for inclusive growth. And next slide. And as you can tell from this, um, there's a lot of different kinds of uses, uh, innovation facilities for sure, networking, 
facilities, incubators for sure, but, but also retail, uh, office, hospitality, um, the, the different kinds of uses that really make up uh, central cities, cityness, density, walkability, um, bikeability, um, that more and more um, as, as we move post COVID are going to be revalued, uh, particularly in the innovation space. Next slide. So from, from the very beginning, what Cortex was trying to do uh, in a city that has experienced enormous deindustrialization and enormous depopulation, it was trying to create several things. First, new jobs for St. Louis, uh, quality jobs, a portion of which could be accessible uh, to a large uh, part of the resident base. Um, secondly, new tax revenue for St. Louis, because that's so fundamental for the city to be able to invest um, both to accelerate the regeneration and redevelopment of this area, but more broadly to provide services and redevelopment opportunities across the entire urban landscape. And finally, and absolutely critical, is to use innovative growth to drive inclusive outcomes. A lot of times innovation and inclusion are seen as separate, unrelated, almost competitive with each other. From the beginning of Cortex, there was an understanding, and I'll talk about the specifics here, of how innovation well done, intentionally done, purposefully done, can drive inclusive outcomes. Next slide. So here's the economic impact um, that, was uh, that was essentially summarized some, for some friends of ours from HRNA advisors. Large numbers of jobs have been created within a relatively short period of time at a time when the population has been declining and jobs have actually been lost from the downtown. So this is a signature impact in any city, but particularly in St. Louis, uh, which has seen an excessive amount of employment decentralization and economic dispersion. So job growth, a uh, company location. Now, initially this started with the life sciences sector, just given the prowess of of the advanced research universities and the hospitals, but it's expanded to other sectors of the economy over time, um, as you'll see from Boeing, and you'll see from some of the other examples, services, um, advanced manufacturing, cybersecurity, ag tech, and increasingly there have been intermediaries that have been either locally formed or brought in from the outside, like BioSTL, a global example um, that has really been locally generated within St. Louis, but also the Cambridge Innovation Center, which came in to basically accelerate commercialization and networking within the campus. So very large impact within a relatively short period of time. And next slide, with enormous possibilities going forward, as, as Julie can talk to, uh, with regard to these innovation districts in the United States, whether it's Pittsburgh, whether it's Cleveland, whether it's St. Louis, whether it's Cambridge, Massachusetts, there's almost a hockey stick effect to growth where you start out by putting in your assets, economic, physical, networking, and the job growth begins to take off and the business formation begins to take off after a number of years. That's exactly what has happened in Cortex. It's a remarkable story. Next slide. The fiscal impact over time is going to be remarkable because there's been substantial tax increment financing investment. That was important, particularly given the market conditions of St. Louis, to get infrastructure built, uh, to get real estate moving. But over time, there's going to be a dramatic uh, fiscal impact which again will be used by multiple parts of the city system, whether it's the city of St. Louis itself, the school district, uh, the museum district, the public library, community college, many different entities will benefit from the growth of Cortex. So it's got a radiating effect across the city landscape. 
and and many um, residents within St. Louis will ultimately uh, be positively uh, affected and benefited um, by the fiscal impact. Next slide. The inclusive impact, though, I think is really what's of the moment. I mean, the U.S. is dealing with some significant uh, issues, as we all know, around growing Black-owned business, around growing uh, Black and Brown participation in the labor market, particularly in the STEMS portion of the labor market. So from the very beginning, there was a focus on expanding Black and Brown-owned business in district construction. But over time, that's expanded to increase board diversity, access to programming, STEM uh, training, uh, STEM STL is part of the bio STL family of intermediaries, training for entrepreneurs, and partnering with the university, particularly WashU, to ensure access to affordable lab space. So inclusive growth and inclusive innovation has multiple meanings. Um, and potentially, again, if, if, if designed well, uh, financed and delivered can really have dramatic effects, uh, particularly in a, in a city like St. Louis uh, that, that has struggled for some period of time. Next slide. As, as many folks from St. Louis on the call know, there is a draft STL 2030 jobs plan that is out for public comment right now. Cortex really ticks the box on the five major strategies of that jobs plan. It's about the inclusive economy. Restore the St. Louis core, not just the downtown, but the areas around Cortex and north of Del Mar Boulevard. Um, it's about building a small business ecosystem that can help Black and Latino businesses start and scale in multiple sectors of the economy. It's about being a talent engine and magnet upgrading the skills of workers so they have access to multiple job opportunities. And it's about 21st century in industries, the convergence economy. The STL 2030 jobs plan calls for quadrupling down on biosciences. And next slide, and this is the last slide. As we all move forward through this very disruptive year, um, it is possible, it is possible that Cortex uh, can be the vehicle, can be the platform, for St. Louis to access what are bound to be very substantial federal counter-cyclical investments around innovation, around infrastructure, human capital, small businesses, and even housing. So what is built at Cortex, what has been built at Cortex, is literally the gift that keeps on giving. It's evolving, it's iterating, uh, it is becoming, and already is, an example of the potential of this new spatial geography of innovation to drive inclusive growth. Um, thank you very much. Um, I really look forward to listening to the panel. And um, Marla, thanks again for, for moderating this. Absolutely. Thank you, Bruce. That was phenomenal. Really intriguing insights. Really sets the stage for quite a lot for the panel to jump in on uh, and opine. So one of the things before we actually go to the panel right now, Bruce, just want to participate in and bring the audience into this as well. We have one question that's come in from the audience that I want to go ahead and, and get in front of you right now. I would love to just pose to you um, from, from Dick Fleming. Are there any national or international examples that you can think of and share of cities and regions that have established and interconnected multiple innovation districts in a single community, creating sort of a, a virtuous structure where there's one plus one equals, you know, one plus one plus one equals five, right? And leveraging economic and entrepreneurial development. Do you have any thoughts to add on that? This is really um, the heart of the question. Um, I think, you know, the interesting part about urban innovation districts in the United States uh, is they are very close to areas of hyper poverty and very racially segregated communities. Now, Drexel University, as you know, is in Philadelphia. West Philadelphia has Penn, has Drexel, has Children's Hospital, has multiple research institutions. But the Mantua neighborhood, literally a walk from West Philadelphia, is one of the poorest in all of Philadelphia. So one of the case studies that I would argue that, or 
ask that people take a look at. The West Philadelphia Skills Initiative, which was basically put together like by the anchors of that innovation district that really are like Wash U and SLU and Barnes Jewish and so forth, has connected hundreds of residents from those communities to good jobs, well-paying jobs in the anchor institutions with real ladders of opportunity. So I would say Philadelphia has been a first mover on that very focused skills initiative side. But frankly, the mantle's out there um, for other innovation districts to leapfrog and, and be the vanguard of inclusive growth. Okay, thank you. That's an interesting example. One that I am familiar with. I spent some time in that area in, in undergrad, and so I remember it well. So let's turn to the panel and actually get some more voices into the conversation here. Thank you all for joining us today. It's great to see all of you. I look forward to some phenomenal remarks and great insights. Uh, and let's start with you, Otis Williams, Executive Director of St. Louis Development Corporation. Mr. Williams joined SLDC in 1998 and has led it since 2013 under Mayor Slay and Cruson working on some of St. Louis's largest projects, including the development of the new Bush Stadium, Ballpark Village, the redevelopment of the old arena site and City Hospital, and of course, the Cortex Innovation Community. So thank you, Mr. Williams, for joining us and, and would love to just start with asking you about inclusive growth, right? Inclusive growth, I, you know, I work in the Center for Inclusive Growth, right? Inclusive growth is the goal of the work we are all doing. But that concept has evolved over the 20 years you've been working in economic development. Can you describe how inclusive growth and expectations for it have changed over time? Would love your thoughts on that. Uh, thank you, Mahler, and thank you for inviting me to participate in the panel. So I, I wanted to just basically say that this has been uh, uh, an effort by all to try and make sure that we have inclusive growth. But let's go back 20 years. At that point, it was much uh, more of a discussion in the public sector because of because of the interest that uh, that we have there, and uh, and so it's just recently that uh, it is because of, of a number of events over time, and I think we are ex experiencing a number of those in the press today, where uh, I think the corporate community and the private community have realized that there needs to be a, a much uh, uh, intense, uh, uh, more intense. Uh, discussion about uh, inclusive growth. And so with all of those uh, uh, those uh, events uh, coming about, I think now what we have is the uh, development of a number of plans. And I think uh, if we go back 20 years, the city had a uh, uh, goals uh, that they were shooting for. Uh, and it may have been the only jurisdiction in this region that may have had uh, printed goals. Uh, but I think today, almost all of the jurisdictions are thinking about it, are talking about it. A few have already uh, you know, uh, uh, approve the, some goals. Uh, but now we also have the private community now coming in, uh, uh, hiring uh, folks to be their inclusive uh, uh, monitor, growth uh, director. And so the discussion is widened. And so I think that's, that's the difference in where, where we are uh, from 20 years ago. Okay, yeah, thank you, really interesting. And Bruce describes the, the St. Louis economic landscape at the time of the Cortex founding. Can you talk about how Cortex fit into the region's overall economic development strategy? Sure. Um, you know, we've been talking about the, the, the growth uh, in that particular geography for a long time. And uh, Bruce described it, uh, uh, you know, really well in the sense that we, we had 200 acres that lay between two major universities, uh, Outstanding universities and the hospital DJC, and uh, and so uh, you know there were lots of thoughts about what to do there. But uh, with a uh, we had something we call techno technopolis at the very beginning. Uh, but then uh, uh, with the help of the uh, institutions uh, like WashU, Amsel, and uh, uh, St. Louis University, uh, the group came together that uh, Bruce defined and developed the concept for Cortex, which we have today. And so uh, it, it took a major effort, but it also took an, took investment from the private institutions to uh, to lay the the uh, groundwork. It was not something that could be done solely by the public sector. And so, with the help of the uh, of the private uh, private entities and institutions, uh, this became a reality. 
Thank you for that, Otis. I, I just want to pull that thread one more, one more strand here. You mentioned this was between two universities. Bruce was just talking about Philadelphia, where there are two universities as an example and a case study we might look at. Do you have a view on universities in particular? And, and it sounds like two universities may be different from one. Is that, am I reading into that too much or does that resonate? Well, I, it may be a little too much, but I think what uh, in, in this case, we had institutional support uh, along with the private uh, support. Uh, we were lucky in the fact that we had two. Uh, and so uh, I think we're reaping the, ben the benefits but but you do need to have a strong anchor to accompany the desire to uh, you know to redevelop in, in the area. Thank you, I appreciate that. Let's turn to Hank Weber. Hank Weber is executive vice chancellor for civic affairs and strategic planning at Washington University in St. Louis and chair of the board of Cortex. Hi, Hank. Thank you for being with us. Uh oh, I think I, I see Hank talking, but Hank, I can't hear you. I'm not sure if others can. Um, but Bruce okay. described the importance. Ah, there you are. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll I'll chime in with a question, and and you can start it. You can say that again. Uh, Bruce described the importance of the anchor institution role as a leader of a major anchor. Can you speak to why having an innovation district matters to to Washington University, and that that picks up on what I was just posing to Otis as well. Thank you very much, Marla. Thank you for moderating this panel and thank you for all of our sponsors. Let me start a little broader, come back to your question narrowly. Uh, as Bruce noted, Cortex has been a remarkable success. For St. Louis, it's meant thousands of new jobs and hundreds of new companies. For Washington University and our academic partners, University of Missouri, St. Louis and St. Louis University, Cortex has created an environment that allows our students, faculty, and staff to commercialize their ideas. This has been extremely important to recruiting and retaining great talent. And for the world, Cortex has meant some great new ideas. Not all of our companies are doing game-changing work, but some are, particularly in the treatment of devastating diseases, including cancer and Alzheimer's. So why has this worked? Why has it been successful? And I think there are a number of them, several of which relate to the anchor, to the existence of the anchors themselves. First, the five anchors have been absolutely committed, as well as been the city, to this initiative over 20 years. This commitment began, as was noted, with $29 million investment in capital. It's included extraordinary amounts of time by the most senior leaders of these institutions, all of whom CEOs serve on the board, and very deep support of the programs and initiatives. Second, we had something to build off of. I think it's really important in these innovation districts to have an area of strength, an area of competitive advantage you can draw off. And for us, that area was biomedicine and ad tech, and much of that was centered at our anchor institutions. Not all, but most. Third, we made the right decision at the right time to bring in the private sector as an additional partner to help us recruit companies, to help us aid in real estate development and placemaking. And that was Wexford, uh, our primary partner. And Look, we're Washington University in St. Louis. Our future, our success is intimately tied to the success of our region. We're asking our faculty to move their families and themselves to St. Louis. We're asking our students, undergraduates, to move here for four years. This is our home. We have a moral commitment. This is also our enlightened self-interest. This is where we're, we're competing with other great institutions. And having places like Cortex that are dense, vibrant, diverse, allow people to commercialize their ideas, to grow their ideas, to mix with people outside of the region is extremely important to our ability to compete with the other great academic institutions in the world. And to, in order to do that, 
it's a lot of work. And that's one point I do want to sense. The miss, I think if there's anything missing in the Kate study, it's grit. This is, Cortex has done great. We've gone to 6,000 jobs. We've gone to now over 430 companies. But, you know, we've lost some companies. We've, go, we've killed ourselves to go after relocations and had them not happen. There have been some tough moments along the way. But because the value of having a revitalized city, because the value of having an innovation district, because the value of having inclusive growth in St. Louis is so strong, people have responded to those hits by doubling down. You know, it's a maxim, but it's really true. That success, the genius is 5% inspiration and 95% perspiration. And as the chairman of this board, along with the uh, CEO, Sam Fiorello, I can tell you that sometimes we feel like it's 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Thank you. Absolutely. That resonates with me. That, that, is, that can be said about so many things, so often the case. As someone who's been involved with, with Cortex from nearly the beginning, and, and can you expand a little bit on, on critical decisions or, or critical moments, right? Are there key things that stand out that were make or break? It's easy now to feel this, this success was inevitable, but there are certainly some, some moments that were, that were turning points or that were key decision make, decisions to be made. Can you talk about that and share one? Oh, there are, there are a number of things, all of which I think we had to get right or pretty close to pretty darn close to right in order to be successful. What is those very clear goals that Bruce mentioned in the introduction? We're in the business of creating jobs. We're in the business of inclusion. And we're in the business of tr creating tax dollars for the city and other public agencies because they can do their work. And everything we've done has been directed to those three goals. We've had a measure. And our board understands that that's what we're about. And when we make decisions, we go back to those three really clear goals. Inclusion, job growth, we go tax revenue. If I were to do a second one of those, it would be the support of the partnership with the city. The partnership mm -hmm. with, they, I mean, Otis was kind and said, without our capital, without our, the, the application of our academic programs, Cortex wouldn't have been successful. But without the land use controls they provided, without the, without the power of eminent domain, something we've almost never used by the way, but having that as a potential in order to acquire land. If the second thing I would say is the partnership with the city is absolutely essential. We would not be here without that. Clear goals, partnership with our with our par partnership with the city of St. Louis. Thank you. That, that, that sounds right. Let's turn now to Julie Waite Wagner. Julie is president of the Global Institute on Innovation Districts and co-author, along with Bruce, of the 2014 report, The Rise of Innovate Innovation Districts, A New Geography Innovation in America which defined the term we're using today. Thank you, Julie, for joining us. And, and would love to start off with asking you, how many innovation districts are there across the world? And where does Cortex fit in that global context? So I wanna thank you for this invitation. And I am joining you from Europe. And my team is global. They're in many different regions. And I think it reflects this sort of emerging phenomenon that is a global one. Our analysis points to 120 uh, innovation districts that are emerging or evolving around the world. But we actually believe that number is higher. And that so we're currently in the process of validating around 80 to 90 additional areas which are likely to be innovation districts and it has to do with a lot of the issues that Bruce talked about before, sort of the changing preferences, the changing trends that are driving these kinds of, of locales to manifest. Now, where we find these geographies of innovation um, 
if I was to sort of look at it from a percentages perspective, the greatest share is in North America, followed by Europe. But there is an in, in really interesting constellation of innovation precincts that are both emerging and evolving in Australia. And if once we break out of this pandemic and can travel, I would strongly encourage many people to try to move and travel to Australia to see the diversity of innovation precincts there. Now, I want to look, though, for a minute about Cortex, because it's I think the question that I would like to sort of push here is sort of where does Cortex sit within this story of 120 districts? And, you know, we haven't done the analytics that sort of like say, okay, here's the ranking and here are the different variables that say you're here versus here. But we can look at it from a qualitative and quantitative view, and we can say that Cortex has reached a level of sophistication. There is no doubt about this. And it's through powerful planning and development tools, which have been talked about before, the inclusion of an enlightened developer. Hank mentioned this, it's Wexford, um, with a long-term view, a very important component of that. The impactful approach about blending programs with development, that it's not a real estate play. It is so much more, it's about an infrastructure and an ecosystem development. That's a different kind of architecture of growth. Um, and so this is, this is what we're talking about. It's a different language. It's a different way of thinking about growth. And then I really want to emphasize the organizational components, the governance structures, the active diverse board that leans in. I think, I think Cortex is the model, frankly. And it's for this reason, you know, we as a separate and an independent uh, organization, a research organization, we are really pleased actually to give and demonstrate that Cortex is a best practice of organizing for success. They have over time, like methodically developed the systems and the structures and when mistakes are made, they course correct and they put the alignment of actors and the financial mechanisms needed to drive new ways of innovative growth. And so for us, Cortex is an important model globally. And we okay. share this model both inside and outside of the United States because Hank, I think you're exactly right. This, this notion of how you organize and how you think about how to structure and strategically align this work and pull all the necessary level, levers, this, that work cannot be understated. And so this is an okay. important thing that differentiates Cortex from many other Yep. So let me let me ask on that. With even with Cortex as a as a best practice, right? As as kind of the beacon of what's what's possible and how these can perform, especially with that commitment over time and the continued adjustment and, and tweaking. Are there lessons still in in other innovation districts around inclusive growth and on other dimensions that Cortex? should be looking to import or continue to use and employ as they bolster and grow from, from here, even at the top? Yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a really good question. I, I think I'd like to sort of posit it as an observation because we know how integral the city um, and city actors have been in shaping and defining um, and catalyzing what could happen in Cortex. But we're also working with a number of innovation districts outside of the United States. And there is a distinction. There is a, something very different in how some of these districts are led and organized. And so in many other cases, Medellin, Colombia, Beersheba, Haifa, and Israel, for example, you will find city governments, and even in Israel, national governments, to some extent, literally leading, managing, running, some aspects and respect key aspects of this work. So it's there's a different sort of structure, if you will. And so while I'm not saying and suggesting that city governments need to champion right the districts at this level of specificity, what they are contributing, what those external, you know, outside of the US districts are contributing to this emerging practice is that they have a built-in framework where district efforts to advance inclusive growth are naturally linked to the city and the region. 
So I, I guess if I had to say, I would call this as a spatial architecture of inclusive growth, which I'm seeing as it being a regional architecture, one where the district, along with many other economic hubs, are naturally embedded into a regional system, such as workforce development and ed educational systems. Yep. Okay. Thank you for that. One question coming in from the audience, we, let me pose that one to you and, and I'll leave that open for other members to chime in on as well as, as, as we move through the group. How does manufacturing fit into this? I, I, I think about, you know, there's maker communities, there's manufacturing that's, that's coming, you know, coming back. Just curious about how you see that fitting in either here in Cortex, as, as we're talking about in St. Louis, or in other innovation districts as you've looked across the you know, across the globe. Yeah, so it, it also depends on how the type of manufacturing. So uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the advanced manufacturing, right? In fact, some of the analysis, because we actually also conducted analysis on Cortex over the, the last year, and we found ourselves finding that some of those tech clusters, some of the tech companies that were developing, prototyping new waves of tech were actually more in the advanced manufacturing sector than what you would consider in sort of computer science IT. So I found, we found that interesting. But we are engaged, for instance, in another geography that has advanced manufacturing and that's Sheffield um, outside of London. So that's the northern part of the UK. And they are creating an advanced manufacturing innovation district but because of the different types of um, products that they're developing, they have created a much more lower density sort of sprawling development. And so now we're thinking out, what do you have to do to create the compactness, the connectivity, the walkability, that importantly defines and shapes these innovation districts. So we're playing with that model there and using that to figure out how to advance the practice. Hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Very good context for what we're looking at here. Uh, let's, let's move to Jackie. Jackie Hutchinson is the Executive Director of the Consumers Council of Missouri and is a member of the Inclusive Growth Advisory Committee at the Social Policy Institute at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, Jackie, it's good to see you again. I think you and I have been on a couple yeah. of conversations together before. So thank you for joining yeah. us today. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear from you on, on your perspective on how Cortex fits into the narrative of St. Louis over the past two decades. And what are the lessons from your perspective that we should draw on inclusive growth for, you know, for the community? Well, having been, um born and raised here in St. Louis, I have uh, seen the decline in St. Louis as, as manufacturing left the city and people left the city. And so I've seen the, the, the decline in the city of St. Louis and uh, Cortex has really uh, been a model for growth in our community. It has stabilized that community around it um, it has provided jobs for the community, but also it had from the very beginning a model a goals for uh, making sure that there was inclusive uh, growth. And so the, it, it included making sure that there were minority and women owned businesses involved in the construction and um, you know, making sure that there were minorities on the board all of the things that were important to making sure that the entire city was able to benefit from, uh, from that growth. Um, as, as they began to see that that wasn't enough to bring in enough uh, uh, African-American jobs or businesses, the, they you know, added more seats to the board and at, did things that you know, were intentional in making sure that things were, that there was inclusive uh, growth. Um, participating in the, um, in the loan fund for construction was very important. It was something that was much needed in the community and it expanded the reach beyond just the, the 200 acres of, uh, of the Cortex uh, 
property into the, the community, expanded that reach. Um, so they've set a new goal. The board has set a, a new goal that I'm really excited about. And uh, just to quote it, the most, to, to make Cortex the most racially, ethnically, and gender inclusive district in the country. And I, I am, I'm really excited about that goal because I think it's a huge goal uh, with potential uh, out, uh, impacts throughout the region. And I, but I think in order for the Cortex to reach that goal, it will uh, in, uh, require ex, uh, extensive movement into the community, moving beyond the 200 uh, acres and beyond the digital divide into the underserved neighborhoods and creating partnerships with schools and creating partnerships with small nonprofits and small uh, community organizations that have a pulse on the community. Um, it, will, it will take engaging our youth. I think that one of the, the things that, that could be, you know, one of the challenges and things that could be done better is to uh, reach those youth who don't even know that Cortex exists and don't know that the opportunities that it provides in this city are there for them also. And so partnerships with schools and underserved communities that would, um, would, uh, would allow them to reach kids at an early age and let them know that there is a possibility for jobs in the tech area that, that they could have uh, with training and, and setting up programs. I like the, the model from uh, Pennsylvania, the, you know, the uh, training program and setting up those mm -hmm. kinds of programs in communities outside of, uh, of the, uh, the district will feed back that talent that we need in order to, to achieve that diversity. Yep, no, that that makes sense, and I, I can see that that relationship that you're talking about is is a really interesting one. Um, one, you know, just one more nudge on that. Uh, you mentioned a number of things that you think would be would be opportunities, and what you think would be you know nice to see for the community going forward from a from an inclusion perspective. Just want to just push you a little bit. Is there anything else? Any other asks or anything else you see as as the broader opportunity of going forward into the future that you would that you would say Cortex can look into from a community and inclusion perspective? Well, yes, I, I think that uh, having maybe some mini hubs in other communities where mm. it could spark growth, you know, and, and be connected back to the, um, the larger uh, footprint but just having many hubs throughout the community would would help. Uh, participating in jobs programs and mentoring, um, it, it would be fantastic if even half of the, you know, the, the employees at the Cortex mentored a child, brought them back to the Cortex, let them know what an innovation district is all about and how it impacts their lives and how it impacts the, the, the full community. Um, I think those are all ideas that, that would help expand the reach and, and let uh, more young people know that there are opportunities out there that are being developed that they can very well take advantage of, and particularly those who don't see college as an option. Um, training programs that would get them into, into jobs would, uh, would be fantastic. But some of those are going to be ha going to have to be taken to the neighborhoods and the communities where they live, and partnerships created with um, the the organizations on the ground that that are already trusted in those communities. Okay, thank you. Those are great thoughts, great suggestions. That mini hub idea is a really interesting one. Um, before we take more questions from the audience, and we're starting to see those come in, and, and please do continue submitting them, uh, let's round out the panel and hear from Sam Fiorello. Sam is president and CEO of Cortex Innovation Community. Sam joined Cortex in March of 2020, just as the pandemic swept the country. 
We'll hear from Sam about Cortex plans moving forward. And, and Sam, thank you for being here. What an interesting time to take on the leadership role here. Um, what lessons from 2020 are you carrying forward as we hopefully emerge from the pandemic and the current extraordinary political circumstances that we find ourselves in? Um, and, and how are you shaping the organization going forward from here, shaping the entity? Thanks, thanks, Marla. Thanks for moderating this. And um, I too want to thank the sponsors and Drexel for the great work here and a chance to um, talk about Cortex. Um, but that's an incredible point. I mean, what we've seen this year is the um, laid bare is the, the um, inequality that exists in our community and across, across our nation where um, um, the haves and have nots um, that, you know, the stock market keeps hitting record highs. And so net worth for individuals um, like myself keep going up. And at the same time, the um, folks who are boots on the ground running our economies, whether they're in grocery stores or bus drivers, um, uh, don't have the luxury to work from home and they've been disproportionately hard hit by this pandemic. Um, we also saw with the um, uh, murder of George Floyd and the unrest that happened from that, um, that there is a lot of pent up frustration and anger, uh, rightfully so, from a huge swath of our population. And so for a place like Cortex, it's incumbent on us to think about how can we be part of the solution? Uh, Jackie talked a lot about um, workforce and talent. And as we work through uh, myself and um, um, members of our board, what uh, will be the next phase of Cortex's life, the next five to 10 years, um, we look at things like, can we be involved in a big way on talent development? Um, talent is the currency of a tech economy, tech jobs, and for a region. And there are two sources of talent. One is your ability to import the best and the brightest from other parts of the country and the world and convince them to put a stake down and build their careers here. And it's important, but the other one is equally and maybe even more important, and that is to mine the local talent pool um, underemployed, unemployed individuals, and um, certainly a large cohort of those individuals, people of color, ha we have to find a way to bring them into this, uh, places like Cortex and the jobs that we create and other innovation jobs throughout the district. So those will be big areas of focus. How can we, with our power to convene, um, the demand side, the employers, the supply side, the schools and education programs, and then the, the training programs that already exist in our community. Um, can we help create something that's accretive and, and um, uh, where the whole is worth more than the sum of its parts? And and would love to, to hear from you more on, on what keeps, you know, how do you think about the strategy for keeping Cortex as a leading innovation district, as other cities use this model. And as Julie mentioned, there are you know, 120 innovation districts now around the world. How do, you, how do you face competition and think about continuing to have Cortex stand out and have a competitive position in the market? No, that's a great question. And you know, I'm fortunate, we're fortunate to have folks like Bruce Katz and Julie um, working with us. Um, advising us, um, giving us a sense for trends, both national and global, and are there lanes that we could occupy? And I, I believe that um, dialing up our presence in workforce training and talent development, um, folk with a with intentionality and purpose for uh, uh, communities of of color, um, we're, we'll be uh, on the leading edge of that if we can do it right. If we can be a place that convenes at scale, the the demand side, the employers and the supply side, whether they're um, middle schoolers through our affiliation with uh, STEM STL, um, getting the word out to what's available or high schools or recently graduated, but unemployed or unemployed, all of those things. And then creating a central vehicle to partner with local institutions that do training programs and education programs and upskilling and to drive something very unique and special. And, and, and I think we do it right. We're talking about, um, hundreds and thousands of um, men and women who are trained and put into uh, jobs, tech jobs throughout our region. And it'll be great for our region. And it will also, Marla, if we can figure this out, it will be a competitive advantage as we try to recruit 
um, other companies to our region because everyone's feeling this pain of how do I meet my workforce needs and how do I meet my aspirations to have more uh, diverse and inclusive workforce? It's not easy. If we can figure out a way to create um, a, a system that helps meet both those, I'm convinced we'll be able to uh, convince companies that don't have a presence in St. Louis and say, one reason I should be in uh, the St. Louis region is for that. So uh, really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let me, let me pose one question to you, Sam, and we'll, we'll get ready to bring the broader panel back up and, and bring others into the conversation here as we switch and, and start to move into the Q&A. Um, but what, what, do you, what do you think about the possibility of Cortex narrowing its, its focus and really honing in on particular industry, like, like say biotech or healthcare, or, 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 should, or do you really focus on maintaining that very broad focus on innovation, inclusive of those spaces and beyond? Um, and what are the incentives and structures that are that are not in place that might need that might be needed to drive you know that kind of that kind of decision? So I think um, Hank mentioned it in his his comments. Um, one of the things, best practices, learnings for others out there aspiring to look at Cortex as a model or any any region is to play to your strengths. You, you can't just. I think it's folly for St. Louis to try to out Boston, Boston, or out San Francisco, San Francisco. So the um, founders of the Cortex Innovation Community said, we have a um, best in class medical school at Washington University that is um, an engine for discovery and solutions to improve the human condition. Um, and St. Louis University has a whole host of things they do well. Um, UMSL as well, our, our, our hospital systems in our region, if you add it up, we punch way above our weight class with our concentration of health systems. Um, we're about to get um, a, a one of the largest federal investments ever made with the um, um, uh, the building of the NGA West, and yeah. that will be another thing that we should leverage. And to say we have something here that's special, and we're going to build on that strength. From there, Marla, I think that so for for Cortex to have that level of diversity is what is the anchoring strength that you're building on. Um, and then from there, again, I think uh, what Cortex is going to do, and it's incumbent on Cortex and every other innovation community in the world, is to say it won't be enough if we create 10,000 more jobs, if those jobs, if there's not equal access to that success of those jobs, if more individuals throughout the community aren't participating in that benefit. Um, Jackie talked about maybe getting out there more and having silos or presence. Um, we're open to all sorts of things. It, how do we make this 200 acre geography a more welcoming place? We are in discussions right now with Harristow State University, historically black college university, two miles east of here, about a possible affiliation so there can be a Harristow State presence on this uh, in this district. And so those students can Every day when they come to classes, be exposed to the programmatic activities that come here, the employers, um, I think it increases their chances for internships, uh, jobs, post-graduation. Um, one of our newest members of the Cortex board is uh, Dr. Corey Bradford, the new um, um, head of Harristow State. And again, that goes back to, and I, and I really give credit to the folks who came before me and the current leadership, Hank and the rest is, it takes intentionality that this has to be part of your definition of success. And by this, I mean inclusive and equitable um, uh, economic growth in, in our region. So, mm -hmm. okay. um, let's let's pose some broader questions to to you, Sam, as well as the entire panel, and enable others to be able to chime in and and offer up some thoughts on this. Um, one of the questions that that I want to bring up here is is how do innovation districts minimize minimize and navigate really the, the digital divide that is present along income, race, and geography, importantly, within, within both urban and rural communities? How has that played a role here? How do you all think about this, this, this particular instance of innovation having sort of navigated that, that fault line that can so often run around, uh, run through the cities? Marla, can I take a crack at that? Go for it, please, Hank. I think it's three pieces. One is it will not happen if you don't focus on it. 
It was the point Sam just made. You have to be extremely intentional. If you simply go to the first person who knocks on your door as a company, you won't achieve that. Second is you've got to work on having your environment be as welcoming as it can be. One of, uh, we're the host at Cortex under normal times of the largest weekly gathering in the world of the innovation community. 500 people come, do seminars, drink a lot of beer, uh, and engage around a whole set of topics in the innovation space. That group is more diverse than the St. Louis region. It's not as diverse at the city, but it is more diverse than the St. Louis region. Uh, and that's by carefully reaching out to communities. But third, and I think it is our future, and I think Jackie, you know, I think eventually we are going to have to do more to not just have people comfortable coming to us, but going to them. I think Jackie's mm -hmm. right that there are going to have to be pieces of cortex and that are located in areas of highly disadvantaged communities. What those are, what they're focused in is part of our current strategic plan. But I believe in saying we've done some of that in, for example, training programs that we sponsored in North St. Louis. But I think we've got to work on making sure we're as welcoming as possible that we're at some point going to have to reach out and have activities on the ground. Yep. Other I, thoughts you know, on I, that I, digital I, divide? Yeah. Julie, please. I had a few sort of observations. I think, you know, COVID and with a number of children now needing to study at home, it exposed the digital divide in a way that we had before. It really, it, it positioned districts to say, wait a minute, we actually should and we do have a role to play. And so I've, I've been sort of monitoring which districts are sort of saying, what does that look like? So some are sort of providing, you know, an ad role and figuring out how do we work with a specific set of schools um, to provide and support and, and reduce that divide. Others are thinking about what should be the new role of utility companies and other kinds of um, infrastructure actors as part of that regional infrastructure and architecture that I was talking about before. I think it goes back to that. I think you're gonna have to look at a broader scale as much as you look at sort of targeted measures. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, yeah, Jackie, were you going to jump in? Yes, I was. Um, there, there's, there are a lot of different components to the digital divide. Uh, part of it is uh, people don't have the uh, the knowledge of the technology, and you're finding that in homes where kids have been given hotspots and computers, and their parents are unable to to help them with their homework because they don't know the technology uh, well enough. And so mm. to bridge that digital divide, we're gonna have to go deeper into the community and make sure that there's uh, access to, um, you know, to just basic computer classes. And it's one of the things that, um, and I just retired from community action agency in, in St. Louis. And, uh, but one of the things that we're, you know, that we've been called on to do at that agency was to help people do things like um, apply for unemployment and figure out how to log into, you know, to their kids' classrooms and those kinds of things. And so it, it's going to take a lot of different kinds of interventions in order to to um, that digital divide and, and get over it. Absolutely. I like that. I like that reframing, right? That divide is not just about access, but it is also about capability and, and understanding and how to apply it. Yeah, I think that speaks volumes. Um, another question that's come in is there's a growing body of data of data indicating that diverse, inclusive economies are healthier, right? That, that their economic growth is greater. Are you, or, or is anyone aware of, of studying and, and of other findings that are, this, that are consistent with that in looking at the Cortex impact on neighborhood 
city and, and regional economies there in and around St. Louis and the broader metropolitan area? I think, Marla, that um, some of uh, Bruce Katz's work with the, with the region on this uh, St. Louis 2030 jobs plan, there's data in there that he calls out about the lost um, economic output from the St. Louis region because we haven't been as inclusive and equitable as we could have been, should have been, and must be. And it's in the billions. I mean, it's the thing is about inclusive, equitable, economic growth is that it's both the right thing to do with for our fellow citizens and having opportunities to thrive it's also the smart thing to do for a regional economy because there's plenty of data that shows that the regions that do it best and no one's figured this out perfectly um, um, have a much more robust balanced healthy economy so um, uh, but I, I know that in Bruce's study, the number we just saw a couple of days ago is is in the billions. So, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Um, yes, I, uh, I, I want to oh, go ahead, Otis. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, in addition to the STL 2030 uh, vision that uh, we all work with Bruce on, uh, you know, we had similar results that uh, came out of our equitable economic development uh, framework that the city specific uh, study to look at economic development. And, uh, uh, you know, as we mentioned several times, intentionality. Uh, we realized, uh, and we, I guess we knew this from the outset, that we had underserved uh, uh, areas within our city but we needed to figure out how to actually put uh, put uh, feet on the ground uh, and actually provide programs and services in areas where we had not done that in the past. And that's what we're doing. So, so I, I, I do think that uh, intentionality is the is a real key uh, here and uh, having uh, all the commitments, both from a public private institutional perspective, uh, come to come to play in all these areas. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now that, that that resonates, and and Otis, there was a question here that that is bringing to mind the conversation you and I started off with at the very beginning of this conversation, and about the the, the university and the present and being in a dense urban area, and 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 the question is, what about areas of the country that don't have the dent that are not dense urban settings, right? That that may not have anchor institutions, or that may not have the the vision or the you know the hospital systems. How do how do those areas fit in? And and Julie would love your thoughts on that. Having looked at a lot of innovation districts, does it work in places that are not quite as as dense and as rich with so much of the institutional structure that we've talked about here at the at the beginning and that Otis was leading with when we started this conversation? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to offer some thoughts on that. I mean, it, we, we are often asked to look at places that have a starting set of assets, whether it's research institutions and medical um, hospitals, or whether it's uh, corporations and companies providing R&D, or whether, and so we're trying to sort of say, where are the assets and attributes that can create an innovation ecosystem that can then be enabled and furthered through intentional efforts to grow inclusive growth? Because we're talking about an innovation district rather than any other type of hub. So we, we sort of look at it as, you know, what are the actors that are currently there? What kinds of unique specializations, re research strengths, and their ability to commercialize those research strengths. And then what's the critical mass? You know, what is the critical mass of research dollars, critical mass of talent, the diversity of talent, the innovation infrastructure? We're looking at all this. We have a very detailed diagnosis to try to understand that. So if you're starting with less, it doesn't mean that you do it. It means that you're going to be needing to think through how do we create the kind of in a, in a, in a ecosystem that strengthens our competitive edge. In some cases, it's the relocation and shifting in other companies or even the unanchoring of anchor institutions into the district can just reignite these areas. So I look at these places as opportunities. We have to really say, do you have a minimum threshold? And if you don't, how do we work with you to get you there if this is really what you want to work on? But generally, if you don't have that baseline, 
it's going to be a tough road. Um, so, you know, I, I, I try apply a very positive approach to think through what's the right kind of growth model for them. And I believe that having that baseline is, is critical. And so having a plan. And so uh, you're fortunate if you have the institutions or the assets available. But uh, even if you don't, I think uh, I think you have to start with that baseline and have a plan. Uh, you know, you may have to expend a little, a, res a few resources to get that plan. There are a number of folks who can help guide. Uh, but, uh, you know, that that way, I think you identify where you may be able to find those resources to help you along. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you're definitely very fortunate uh, if you have, uh, you know, the anchor. But we're experiencing that very similar situation in North St. Louis where we don't have any anchors. Uh, you know, we are trying to revitalize the community. We need to be able to be able to bring resources there. And so how do we get those resources there? And so, yes, yeah, it is a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Sam, you're, you are operating this day to day and, and are thinking about all of the strategic pieces and how it fits together. Can you imagine how you would do that if you didn't have St. Louis, it didn't have Wash U and, and the other institutional components of this? I imagine the answer is probably not, but just curious about your, your thoughts on that. I, I, I can't, Marla, and I think that's, um, you know, when I led my discussion, it's figure out your points of strength, your points of leverage, and build on those. And, you know, again, we, we have some incredible um, academic institutions and, and um, med schools and hospitals. And I, I, I agree with Julie that it's really tough I've seen some of it the, before I came here, I worked at uh, the Danforth Plant Science Center and it's affiliated research park and that's food and ag. So it was much more in rural America and there's some opportunities there. And I think there's opportunities for um, um, partnerships. So if there are new devices on precision ag through um, a startup in the, in the district here and it leverages the uh, NGA West because it's location sciences and precision, um, Will, can there be a center where a lot of farming happens to get a feedback loop to um, test the results to make sure that um, we're solving for the, the right problems that the farmers or users are having? And, and I think I know our partners at BioSTL have spent some time reaching out to um, uh, different parts of rural Missouri to think about how uh, there can be some partnerships that are symbiotic. So, but, but I think to answer your questions, it's really tough without that. Yeah. Yeah, I would imagine it would be. Um, let, let's finish up with one last question here and, and then we'll wrap. I think we are, are just about at time here. Um, I'd be curious about the, the existing businesses, right? How has Cortex in its development, in its evolution over time, how has it worked to establish, to keep the established businesses in place or, or bring businesses that were already around that area? Um, especially the, the many nonprofits that were already resident. How have those been incorporated into, into Cortex? Let me say a few things and then our colleagues, my colleagues will I'm sure add on. First of all, Cortex has turned out, Cortex has been very intentional about while it has its strengths in biotech and ag tech, having a broad portfolio. Uh, I think anybody who's from the Midwestern United States and watched how much we suffer from the decline in manufacturing realizes that you wanna have a broad portfolio. One of the best things about Cortex is we're about say, over 6,200 jobs. Nobody's over 800 jobs. We have jobs in services. We have jobs in tech. We have jobs at IT as well as biotech, et cetera. We've worked really, really, really hard to incorporate and support the businesses that are there and that want to be there that help the district. We also know, and that's include, for example, an effort that Sam has been deeply involved in, is to make sure that as companies, particularly lab companies, that we have affordable lab space. Bruce mentioned this, and he, so that they can grow in Cortex, so they don't. Particularly important for minority companies. And we do do some subsidization. Uh, that's, that's part of our policy. 
but you have to be really intentional. And for us, it's intentional about the portfolio of companies across industries, et cetera. I grew up, I'm old. So I grew up with the city of the United States that had the highest income in the United States was Detroit. When I, Detroit had the highest income in the United States. They turned out to be too dependent on the auto industry. And so we're committed at Cortex, not just to inclusion across who's working there and who's starting companies. We're committed to some inclusion across the diversity of business types. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other thoughts on that? Otherwise, uh, I will I will close us out. Anyone else on the on the existing incumbent businesses that were that were in place? Oh, just the the, the, the just a kind of the, the incumbent. We have worked with every company that worked, was in Cortex. There was essentially no residents, and to some extent, mm -hmm. it because of um, which, in some ways, frankly, made this task easier in terms of it manufacturing but we have worked yeah. with every business often in to who that was there to relocate with an extremely strong preference that they relocate in the city of st louis and we have been overwhelmingly successful so when we've yeah. said when, so as we've worked with businesses over time and we've needed the land to assemble Otis has been involved in many of these and been extremely helpful. And our strategy is we want you to relocate and we want you, if at all possible, to be in the city. And they almost all are. Thank you. Yep. Well, we will make that the final word here. And let me say on behalf of the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, on behalf of all of the panelists here, we want to say thank you very much for your time and engagement for to Bruce, to Otis, Hank, Julie, Jackie, and Sam, thank you so much for sharing today and being part of this conversation. Uh, look forward to following up on this and, and please do check out the case study from the Drexel Center and what they put together. Have a great afternoon. Bye now. <laughs>